So, hi everybody. My name is Fraser Kane. I am the publisher of Universe Today, and once again, it's time for your weekly space hangout for March 8th. 2012. This week, we've got a ton of asteroid news coming from Emily Lakdawalla and Phil Plate. We've got information on the Next Generation Suborbital Research Conference, uh, information on this uh, solar storms that have been buffering the Earth in the last couple of days, uh, and uh, amateur, astrono am amateur astronomers flashing the International Space Station. And we've got a special guest this week as well. Um, so let's all int introduce everybody. So uh, our special guest, I'll start with a special guest, is uh, Ryan Kobrick. He's a postdoc at MIT, and he's the executive director of Yuri's Night. And for those of you who don't know, Yuri's Night is going to be coming up very soon. So we'll be talking with, uh, with Ryan about Yuri's Night, the history, and, uh, and how you can get involved, which is a big party to celebrate space exploration. So hi, Ryan. Welcome. Hi. Thanks. And so we've also got, of course, we've got Alan Boyle from MSNBC's Cosmic Log. We've got Emily Lakdawalla from the Planetary Society. We've got Nancy Atkinson from Universe Today. We've got Pamela Gay from Astronomy Cast. And we've got Phil Plate, the bad astronomer, and me. All right, so this week we're going to start with the asteroid news. Let's get, let's get all, the, you know, all the stuff that's going to kill you out of the way first. So, so Emily, you've got news on asteroid, uh, I guess we'll call it DA14, to, to, which is different from AG5, which we'll be talking about shortly. Why don't you give yeah, us the history of this? That's right. It, it doesn't help that there's such an alphabet soup of numbers around the names of these asteroids. It's kind of a pain, but there's so many of them, really, there's no other option. So um, DA14 is um, a very interesting, uh, smallish asteroid, but still big enough to be concerned about. It's about 50 meters across. And it was discovered recently, um, actually after it had already passed by Earth and, and on its way away from us. But it happens to have this peculiar orbit that has a period of 366 and a quarter days, which means that it's uh, very close to Earth's orbit. And in fact, it, when it comes back around to this, when Earth comes back around to the roughly the same position next year, um, DA14 is going to fly very close to Earth indeed, um, much closer than geosynchronous satellites. It's, it's going to be a very close path which is actually really great news. We love very close misses because it gives us a chance, excuse me, <coughs> it gives us a chance to study these asteroids up close with telescopes and uh, with radar imaging and stuff. But the reason that I think that this particular story is exciting is because it was discovered by a group of amateur astronomers, um, uh, the La Sagra Sky Survey, and they have three telescopes, one of which was recently upgraded to a new kind of CCD with the help of a Planetary Society Gene Shoemaker Near-Earth Object Grant. Sorry, I'm not... <gasps> And this is a grant program that we run um, that gives pretty small grants, just a few thousand dollars to um, amateur and underfunded professional astronomers who can help reduce our risk from near-Earth objects by doing discovery and follow-up surveys to track them and, and make sure that we know exactly where they're going to be going. And the reason that asteroids that are so close to Earth are, are difficult to discover is because when they're passing very close to Earth, they're moving very quickly. So you have to take images in very quick succession in order to be able to catch the asteroid moving across your field of view. Their old CCDs had very long readout times. Their new CCD has quick readout time so they can take pictures in quick su succession. And they were actually looking for asteroids in weird places because they said, ah, oh, the Catalina Sky Survey has surveyed the ecliptic. They're going to find everything um, that's, that's pretty close and in, in the normal places that we find asteroids. So we're going to take our new camera and point it in a totally different part of the sky, very high inclination, um, close to the sun in the wee early hours of the morning and just see if there's anything there. And lo and behold, they found something that was on its way out from Earth and that could, be, uh, could come quite close to us next year. So it was an interesting discovery, and, and we're very proud that we helped enable this and, and lots of other teams to, to make these kinds of discoveries. I've heard that those kinds of asteroid targets might be really interesting for, for fu as future destinations for spaceflight. I know that those kinds of, of asteroids, when they have a very similar orbit to the, to the Earth, you don't require a lot of velocity difference to get to them, to explore them. Is that a possibility? Something like Tutatis? 
Uh, yes, well I think that the, the goal would be to send asteroids or whatever exploratory mission to an asteroid that is very close to Earth's in orbit for the reason that you mentioned, but is not so close that by messing with it we could accidentally do something to make it come into <coughs> Earth's orbit. So we don't want to mess with Apophis, you know, we don't want to mess with Tutatis, but something right. that, we're, that we're sure is going to miss us is the kind of asteroid that we want to play with. Right. Uh, so definitely, uh, you know, can we sort of nip this in the bud? There is no risk, no danger. It's not going to kill us. This one is not going to kill us. A promise? I promise. Okay. Right. Cross my heart and hope to die. Okay, Phil, so let's talk about the one that might not kill us. That's yeah, AG5, right? So the second asteroid in the news is uh, 2011 AG5. This is bigger than uh, the one Emily was talking about. It's about 150 meters across, 140, something like that. We don't know exactly how big these things are because we can't see them as objects that are uh, resolvable in the telescopes. They're just points of light. And so you have, to, you have to estimate their size by knowing their distance, which we can determine, and their brightness, and then assuming how reflective they are. Something really dark has to be bigger. Something really shiny is smaller. But most asteroids are very dark, and so you can estimate their size. This one's probably about the size of a football stadium, which is small for an asteroid, but you, know, you don't want this thing hitting us. And it was discovered last year, and when you project its orbit forward, in February of 2023, it's also going to pass relatively near the Earth, about a million miles away. Now, I have a, uh, I have a model to show you what's going to happen here. here. This is actually a meteorite that I own, and here is a squishy Earth ball. Now, the Earth has gravity, and what happens is when an asteroid passes near the Earth, it bends the orbit. Now, if it passes really near the Earth, the orbit gets bent a lot. When it's farther away, it doesn't get bent as much. Now, there are these places in the sky, these regions called keyholes. And if the asteroid passes just through one of those keyholes, the orbit is bent just enough that at some later date, it's going to orbit the sun a few times, then come back and hit us. We learned about these uh, through the asteroid Apophis, which was discovered a few years ago and, and made a lot of news because there was some chance it was going to hit the Earth. Well, it, it turns out probably not, at least not for that one. 2011 AG5, it turns out, in February of 2023, is going to pass very, very close to a keyhole that exists out there in space. And if it does pass through that, then in the year 2040, 17 years later, boom, it'll hit us. Now, the problem is we don't know the orbits of these things perfectly. Now, with DA14, we know the orbit well enough that uh, we know that a year from now we can project that forward and say, yes, it's going to miss us. But the farther in the future you try to project these orbits, the harder it is to know where they are. A little uncertainty in the orbit now means a much larger uncertainty later in time. And so when you're looking at something you know, in, in the year 2023, which is 11 years from now, it's hard to say if this asteroid is going to pass through that keyhole or not. You can calculate the odds, and it turns out the odds of it passing through that part of space in 2023 is about 1 in 625, which is way higher than I would feel really comfortable with. Now, it's not really good odds. It's not like, you know, run around, ah, panic or anything like that. But it's high enough that we should be keeping our eyes on this. And it turns out we are. NASA is, is looking at this. There are a bunch of other people who are looking at this. It turns out it's on an orbit that makes it hard to observe right now. It's near the sun. But in September of next year, in 2013, it'll be far enough away from the sun that people will be able to train their telescopes on it, and we will get a better look at it. Most likely, as what usually happens with these things, when you nail the orbit down better, you find out it's going to miss the keyhole and we're safe. But we don't know that yet. And so uh, what's interesting to me about this, what makes this different than a lot of these other asteroids, is that Rusty Schweikart, who was an Apollo 9 astronaut and asteroid expert, he's, he's part of a group that is trying to figure out what to do if an asteroid is coming towards the Earth and how we can deflect it is actually calling on NASA to uh, look into creating a mission to deflect the asteroid. Not planning the mission, not building anything, just saying, hey, you know, maybe we should look at some of the physics and math of how we could deflect this thing if we need to. The idea being that if you have this asteroid moving, you hit it with a spacecraft really hard and push it enough that uh, after a few orbits it misses the Earth. Uh, this is all very interesting to me because uh, as we discover more of these, as Emily points out, we're finding these things in weird orbits. You know, some of them come close, some of them don't. But 
there will come a day, it may not be today, it may not be for 100 years, but there will come a day when the odds of an asteroid hitting us will be much higher, and we will have to make a decision to build a mission to, to go to it. And I think discussing this openly right now is a good idea. Yeah, they're, and they're, they're doing a really good job. I know the, their, their foundation, Rusty Schweikert's foundation, is doing a really good job of, of proposing these kinds of very sensible missions, not just to try and move them, but even to just place transmitters on the asteroids themselves and then just be able to watch their position and know and be able to measure their movements with greater accuracy and really be able to predict their, their motions into the future. So right. that's, pretty, uh, that's the, pretty exciting. The two questions I'm getting the most on when I write about this is, why don't we know the orbits better? And it turns out when you're measuring the positions of the asteroid just to calculate its orbit, you can't get an exact position. And you can usually do well enough for the near term, but again, the farther into the future, the harder it gets. And the other one they're asking a lot is, are we accounting for the gravity of the Earth when we calculate these orbits? You know, the DA-14 is going to pass something like uh, 30,000 kilometers above, uh, uh, from the Earth's center, which is really close. And the answer is yes. Of course, what they do is they calculate exactly how everything's going to interact so that they can know, especially when they're close encounters. If you ignore the Earth's gravity, that changes everything. So, yes, they do put that in to calculate this. The problem with something like DA-14 is we don't know exactly how the Earth's gravity is going to affect it. So while we know it's going to miss next year, we have to keep our eyes on it. As Emily said, get as many people observing these things as we can so that we can figure out how far in the future uh, or, or what the asteroid will be doing in, you know, five, six, ten years. Another thing that's important with these really small asteroids is something called the Yarkovsky effect, which is where when the sun shines on them and they re-radiate that heat away after they've rotated some, they actually kind of propel themselves in a direction that's different from the direction that they're orbiting. And um, how what the magnitude of the Yarkovsky effect is depends on things like the shape of the asteroid and, and its surface properties and which direction its pole is pointed and all kinds of other stuff like that. So we have to learn a lot more about each individual asteroid um, when they're very small in order to predict their future paths. Right, all these asteroids, it's the equivalent, they've got like little thrusters on them as the, as the, the sun is hitting them. They're, they're moving themselves, jiggling themselves around in the solar system over long periods of time. Um, all right, well, let's, let's move on. So, Pamela, you just came back from the Next Generation Suborbital Research Conference. So, can you give us a couple of highlights? Yes, th this was an amazing conference. It opened up with, with Neil Armstrong taking us through a review of the last time America focused on suborbital space flight. And this was actually back in the 50s when we had the X X-15 uh, airplane. It seems like the wrong word. It was essentially a a rocket that they had wings glued onto that they put an astronaut in the front and hoped it didn't explode. Um, so now we, we've entered a new era where everything that was old is becoming new again. And we have all these young, brand new space corporations in America working to figure out how do we, with modern technology, repeat the discoveries of, of the, the 50s and get humans back into space but now on high-tech, tourist-friendly spacecraft, rockets, uh, space planes, uh, things that get dropped from aircraft and then go up to suborbital using balloons. The technology diversity there was quite amazing. And the things that people have to think about are, are actually somewhat complex, and many of them are things that I hadn't been thinking about going into this. So for instance, you want even your space tourists to be wearing pressure suits during launch just in case something goes wrong. So just like we had space shuttle astronauts during liftoff in their orange pressure suits that would protect them from, from suborbit and lack of oxygen in case of an emergency, tourists have the same thing. So where with our astronauts we'll do fairly custom fit, fit spacesuits, there's not really the budget to be doing that for someone who's launching once. So there's, there's David Clark spacesuits and several other companies are working to solve this by creating basically plug-and-play spacesuits where you have a whole variety of hands, you have a whole variety of torsos, a whole variety of legs, a whole variety of helmets, and you put together the pieces that fit your body. Now this kind of makes spacesuits the bowling shoes of space tourism. Because the number that kind of frightened me is they're estimating that these spacesuit components will last about 13 years. And they'll get used about once a week. And that's about 600 people wearing each spacesuit. 
and the odds are about 30% of them are going to biologically respond badly to the launch process. So trying to figure out how to do that in a safe and sanitary and non-stinky, non-gross kind of way is a challenge. And they're trying to solve things like, how do we make space affordable for educators? Because these companies aren't just um, promoting space tourism for the wealthy. They're also promoting, here is a method for researchers to launch their experiments without relying on NASA. So here are the research racks for putting your components into. Here are the variety of techniques that we have. Here are the different times in microgravity that you're going to be able to experience. And so they're, they're trying to figure out how do we do this so that it's affordable. And they also want to open up space for kids. And, and Here's where it starts to get trickier because, well, I just found out one of our local school systems is, is looking to potentially middle of the school year lay off teachers due to lack of budget. And if you can't afford your science teachers, it makes it hard to justify the $1,000 price tag of a shoebox just for launch, let alone the cost of the tools, the equipment, and everything else that you're going to launch into space. So the companies are trying to figure out how do we do the entire pipeline of getting kids launching things into space, most affordably on balloons, least affordably on spacecraft. How do we give researchers access to space? How do we train researchers to go into space? And how do we get the tourists back and forth without the bowling shoe problem in the spacesuits? Um, and the thing I think I love most is seeing all of these companies that are working and developing rockets that take off straight up, do their thing in space, but then land on rockets coming backwards. And when you look at these rockets, it actually looks like the fins, which you'd expect to have the, the angled bits going up, are actually on upside down, and my hands don't quite rotate like that. And this is because the fins, the stabilization fins, aren't on the rockets to allow them to, to be more stable going up. They figured that part out. They're actually on to keep the rocket stable as it's coming down for a landing. So parachutes may be a thing of the past. That'd be great. So all this cool technology uh, will get adopted right away and we'll have regular people going into space tomorrow. I, I'm saying it's probably closer to 2020, but what was yeah. amazing was all of the people that have already paid their down posits, their, their deposits to go into space and Virgin Galactic really is just a couple of years away from starting the journeys. That's cool. That's, that's when the rubber's really going to hit the road. Yeah. All right, Alan, why don't we talk about uh, the weather in space? <laughs> sure. <laughs> I was going to say you mentioned the two-year rule, uh, that it's always going to be two years before the next uh, suborbital spacecraft uh, flies. So we'll, we'll see if the two-year rule gets broken. Is that uh, like the fusion, 30 years for fusion? That's right. Fusion yeah. is the feel of the, of the future and always will be. <laughs> uh, so, uh, But anyway, getting to space weather, which is another thing that I guess could potentially kill you if it's strong enough. And, and based on some of the reports that we got in, in advance of the solar storm, storm's arrival today, uh, you might have thought that it could kill you. Well, there's, there was no real uh, danger of that at all. Uh, people were concerned that it might disrupt uh, satellite operations or communication links or electrical grids. Uh, there was a famous case in 1989 where Hydro-Quebec had a power outage that was caused by a solar storm. Uh, and so we had two uh, fairly strong solar flares thrown off by the sun in the X class, which is the most powerful category. And so people were thinking, wow, this is going to kind of create the most uh, powerful solar storm that we've seen during this uh, cycle, the 11-year solar activity cycle. So it came. It, it, it's arrived. It's sweeping over Earth's magnetic field right now. And it turns out it's not as bad as uh, people thought it was going to be. Uh, there's a classification system for uh, solar storms and and uh, it turns out that this one right now is a G1. They were thinking it might be a G3. Uh, the bottom line is that it's only a minor disruption for power grids and satellites. Uh, if you go to uh, swpc.noaa.gov, you can keep track of uh, how the storm is doing. And there's an interesting si scientific sidelight to this as well, is that it depends sometimes on the orientation of the radiation storm, uh, what the effect is going to be. And uh, it turns out we were lucky on two counts this time around. First of all, uh, the solar storm, uh, the geomagnetic component of that storm isn't coming right at us. It's kind of a glancing blow. 
And the second thing is that uh, if you look at the, uh, the magnetic orientation as if it were a bar magnet. Uh, you get a stronger storm if you have Earth's poles north and south, and then you have the uh, radiation storms poles south and north. Uh, if they're opposite, that's a problem. But it turns out that in this case, the poles are aligned. And that is one of the reasons why this storm is not as serious as it could have been. So, uh, so far, it's good news. Uh, the experts say there still could be uh, a larger effect that's coming at us over the next 24 hours or so. But I think a lot of people can breathe easy and, and realize that uh, the Mayan apocalypse has not come upon us quite yet. Well, I still think it's astounding at the level of tracking and, and uh, sort of real-time analysis of this that goes on now on the Internet. I mean, before, you might hear someone say, hey, yeah, I saw a really great aurora last night. And you're like, well, yeah, I didn't see it, right? But now it's... Now I'll get an email or a tweet that a suspected roar is actually going to happen, and then I'll go to a website, and it'll show me the specific mapping over the Earth of the places that are experiencing a high amount of, of, um, of interaction with the, you know, with the solar storm, and even predictions on where will be some of the best places. And I'll say, oh, yeah, I can see that there's a nice bright red spot right over where I live, and I can walk outside and see an aurora. So... Um, you know, if you've if you've never seen an aurora, it's a it's an, a pretty amazing sight. And now is the greatest time, I think. We finally have this this technology that you can just be notified instantaneously that something really interesting is happening. So so if you live in you know in some of the more northern or southern uh, latitudes, definitely try to find your way to to one of these notification systems so that you can stay tuned. And it's, it's really just that. You just, you just walk outside, look up, and, and you're seeing an aurora. You know, if you live in, the, in Europe, in, you know, Canada. Right, Scandinavia, Canada. It, yeah. You, can you and I, Fraser, are kind of lucky in that regard uh, but because you're in uh, British Columbia and I'm in Washington State. So yeah. uh, we, we have a little bit more of a chance this week than somebody who lives in, say, Colorado or Florida or, you know, some poor region like that. Yeah. Uh, uh, but another thing that you said, uh, you know, and you're right, that since the last uh, solar maximum, there have been a lot of uh, resources that are, are being brought to bear on sun monitoring like the uh, Solar Dynamics Observatory, which is really a great uh, space probe. And, and we've got the stereo probes that are watching the sun. So uh, that's the big difference this time around, is that we have a lot more space resources. We get a lot more advanced warning of these sorts of things coming. And, and people who are in charge of the electrical grids or the satellite constellations can take steps to, to make sure that they're protected in case something untoward toward happens. Yeah. You guys mentioned um, the photos that you can see and you can go out and see the aurora, but there's also a rubber chicken that can help inform <laughs> the public on uh, what's going on on the sun. And there's a lot of amazing photos that are available through Camilla SDO, who's the uh, official mascot for NASA. You bet. Yeah. Yeah, those well, pictures are phenomenal and the, and the animations and videos. I can watch that stuff all day. And, but, and just uh, to clarify, uh, she's the mascot of SDO, not of NASA. <laughs> right. Yes. But it'll and change. also, I just wanted to mention that uh, spaceweather.com does a great job of, of covering these auroras and, and putting together the galleries. And so that's probably your go-to place if you want to see great pictures of uh, auroras. Now, one, now one of the oh, go ahead, Emily. Well, one of the reasons that, that we're getting such better predictions now, too, is because this whole idea of space weather, they announced at the American Geophysical Union meeting last December that they finally have a model of what happens from a solar flare to the Earth that's good enough for them to kind of plug it into the top of their Earth weather, weather models so they can now actually make predictions where really before last year they weren't confident enough in their model to, to tell anybody anything reliable about what these solar, solar storms might do to us. Of course, they're still predicting the weather, so it's not that reliable. <laughs> and there's, it's interesting that uh, there's a little bit, I think, of friendly competition you're starting to see between Goddard Space Flight Center, which uh, has the uh, Earth-observing satellites, and, and uh, the uh, Space Weather Prediction Center at NOAA, which historically has been the folks in charge of predictions. And so uh, every once in a while, you get a little back and forth about, well, exactly when did this storm hit, or what's it going to do? Uh, but competition is good, I guess. Um, so, so let's go to our last story this week, and that's with, with you, Nancy. Um, 
you've got a really cool story about some amateur astronomers flashing the International Space Station. Yeah, and it's not as risque as it sounds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Double it's entendre. a really entendre. Yeah. Yeah, it's the really fun story for uh, people who enjoy watching the International Space Station pass overhead like I do. Um, anyway, there were, uh, um, you know, of course, of course from uh, images and videos that we see from the International Space Station, we do know that the astronauts could see city lights and that kind of thing. But a lot of people have wondered if you were down flashing a light of some sort at the International Space Station, could they see you from a dark area? And I guess a few people have tried this, and there has not been any success so far. But last weekend, uh, two astronomy groups from Texas, the uh, San Antonio Astronomical Association and the Austin Astronomical Society, uh, put together a, a big event. And they, they actually did this. And uh, they, of course, ahead of time had arranged this with astronaut Don Pettit. One of their members was a friend, and so even before he launched, they had this kind of arranged, but they had to pick a, a good time to do it. And uh, they got a searchlight company to l lend them two 800 million lumen searchlights, and then they also had a one watt um, Arctic blue laser pointer. And uh, I thought when I first saw the video, which is everybody should watch it. It's it's on our um, story on Universe today. I thought they must have some sort of tracking system because the searchlights were just following the space station in the sky. And this was a dark pass. So this means that the space station was not lit up by, by the sun's light. It was a dark pass. So the, the um, amateur astronomers had to find the location in the sky and point this, the searchlights at the space station. And they were actually lighting up the space station. Now, it turns out they probably didn't need the two 800 million lumen searchlights because um, they were also pointing this, this uh, laser pointer at the space station. That was being held at a steady, in a steady light. The, the searchlights were being flashed off and on. And, uh, but astronaut Don Pettit said that he could actually see the, the blue um, uh, laser pointer when the searchlights were turned off. Whoa. So. Yeah, so they were in a dark sky region out in, in Texas. So, um, but anyway, and, and also their system for turning the, fla the searchlights off and on was also kind of low tech, but it was really effective. They just had um, people, you know, zooming the, moving the searchlights manually following the station. And then they had other people holding up sheets of plywood in front of the light to block the light. They had it two seconds on, two seconds off. And uh, anyway, Don Pettit was able to take images and uh, that clearly showed the, the lights there. And uh, it was, it's pretty neat. It's a lot of fun. how much anyway. that is like smoke signaling? <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, if they need yeah. a way to communicate with the space station and you know, the internet goes down, they can use some binary code, Morse code. Now, one, one, inter spotlights. Yeah, one interesting I, footnote on this that I haven't seen yet on the internet, so, I, so I, I may need to blog it myself, was back in around 2005, Dexter Southfield High School in Massachusetts had one of the astronauts on the ISS, ISS hold up a corner cube that they were, fl they were um, shooting a laser beam off of in order to do high speed imaging that they could correct the images more accurately. So they were tracking on the reflective laser light off of the corner cube. Now the astronauts at the time couldn't see and they were doing this with a fully illuminated ISS and the laser light was coming from the city of Boston so there was no hope of seeing it but it's still cool to note that a high school back in 2005 was able to shine a laser off of a corner cube and do high-res imaging of the ISS. That's really cool. All right, well, well why don't we get on to the, uh, to the special, special guest this week and this is Ryan Kobrick uh, from, uh, from Yuri's Night. So what's, what's Yuri's Night? So Yuri's Night, in uh, a nutshell, is the World Space Party. So what that means is that on April 12th, every year, people all over the world get together and celebrate uh, Yuri's Night. So Yuri's Night started um, 12 years ago, but really it started 52 years ago when the first human went into space, Yuri Gagarin. And so it, his flight was on April 12th, and then 20 years later was the first shuttle flight also on April 12th. And so this was sort of seen as a, a cosmic date, and... Uh, the founders, George and Loretta Whiteside, kind of came together with a few other people and said, hey, let's, let's get people together and let's throw a party. Um, so it started as simple as that, and right off the bat, they had 60 events. 
and it's been growing every year ever since. And so last year for the 50th anniversary of human spaceflight, there was over 600 events in uh, over 75 countries, and we even had an event up on the ISS where the astronauts were all wearing Yuri's Night t-shirts, like the one I'm wearing, but I'm not sure if, uh, if I'm on camera or not. But um, the, uh, they're all wearing shirts, and they had a dinner and a movie night up on the ISS. So it's, um, it's for all ages, it's for all kinds of events, and it, it's really a global outreach initiative to bring people together to kind of celebrate humanity in space. And so if people want to participate in Yuri's Night, where can they find out more information? So um, we've got our website, yurisnight.net, and uh, I can be a little risky here and try to share my screen with some of the web pages. I much. wouldn't, but I okay. would, uh, yeah, because like I said, it can sometimes crash. So Emily's sharing over on in another window, so I think okay. we, can, we can have faith that Emily can, can navigate. If you want, like, just go to the Yuri's Night site? Sure, yeah, so the Yuri's Night page is... And on the Yuri's Night site, you'll see a map. And so the map is all the little lights coming on as the events are registering. And so in the top right corner, you'll see a little button that says register. And that's where people should go to register. Um, it's very simple. You fill out your name. If you haven't been um, an account holder before, it's really simple to start your own account in our MCC, our Mission Control Center. Um, and then once you register that and some basic information like city, which date you're holding it on, hopefully on or close to April 12th, uh, then we'll get you verified and you'll be on the map like everyone else. So um, registration just opened uh, at the beginning of February, so it's lighting up fast and we hope that we really connect with everyone around the world. Um, we've got a lot of uh, online resources because we've been around for 12 years. We've really utilized all the cutting edge um, internet capabilities as they come out and now, this, well this is my first time on Google Plus Hangouts, but uh, of course we'll be trying to use this as a tool for helping people connect around the world. And so uh, we're early adopters of just doing generic webcasts to the point where last year and also the year before, Space Vidcast was hosting our event. So it did a 12-hour webcast two years ago and a six-hour webcast last year, which had um, over 10,000 viewers per hour, unique viewers, not just uh, cyclic hits. So. Um, the engagement's been large online as well, and I mean, we have Facebook, which is probably our biggest way of connecting to people and running lots of different contests for people to get involved. Last year, we gave away a uh, zero-G flight out of Moscow and a VIP tour of Baikonur for a Soyuz launch. Uh, so we, we have all these exciting things that just pop up um, just because of our kind of unique nonprofit way of engaging the public. Um, other things to check out, which we'll be launching soon, is that we actually have a new page that we're putting up that's going to have resources for kids that are under the age of 12, like what kind of events can I run at my school for, for my kids um, that can help celebrate space or, or they can learn about rockets and spacesuits and everything else. So all those things are brand new and coming out, and uh, it's exciting to see how Yuri's Night has changed over the years. My first Yuri's Night was... Back in 2003, I was doing an internship at the XPRIZE Foundation, and uh, Peter Diamandis took me to a lunch with uh, George and Loretta, and that's when I met them. They're like, hey, do you want to come be involved with our space party? And I'm like, oh, that sounds like fun. And <laughs> so they pulled me in pretty easily, and we did an outreach event with JPL, and then we, of course, had the party at uh, LAX at their encounter, which already looks like a spaceship, so it was pretty easy to have something there. And um, ever since that, I've been involved. Uh, Penn State did it, ran it for two years. Then I went to Boulder for my PhD and ran it for five years there. Uh, now I'm out at MIT, so I'm more engaged with running the global executive team. But it's just one of those things that once you get involved, you really want to participate more and more and really offer as much as you can. And it is like a secondary job. Of course, everyone on our team is volunteers. So everyone's really enthusiastic and excited and it's great to bring in people from around the world to get them involved with this. That's awesome. All right, so why don't we, uh, <clears throat> why don't we see if anyone has questions over on the, uh, on the, the live stream. Um, sorry, I just got to get organized here. Um, so yeah, so, so again, this is the part where we will answer your questions. If anyone's got any questions about either the topics that we discussed or just space and astronomy or Yuri's Night, that would be great. We'd be glad to, uh, to answer them here. Um, and feel free, Ryan, to jump in on, on any question that you know the answer to. Um, <laughs> hey, 
Sometimes I just assign them. So you can ask your questions. There's two ways you can do it. One is you can ask a question on the uh, on the thread where the live video is being posted on Google+, which is this one that ends in uh, 4EMF. That's the up at the top of your, your browser. Uh, you can also uh, use the hashtags uh, Hangout and CQX, and that will uh, send us through the Twitters, and we can answer questions from there, and we'll just... We'll roll through those questions until we run out of time. So, um, uh, so Jerry Nguyen, uh, man, I'm sorry, Jerry. We talk all the time, and I don't know how to pronounce your last name. Uh, anyway, uh, so how does the Earth's gravity affect the path of the asteroid that Emily was talking about? How many passes before the path is altered enough to hit us? Unfortunately, it's not that easy um, because uh, each one of them is like a gravity assist. It does alter the orbit every time, but there's not like a specific number. It's not like it comes closer to Earth each time. Each one, it just changes the orbit around the sun a little bit, and sometimes it changes the orbit to one that's less likely to inter intersect Earth, and sometimes it'll change it to one that's more likely to intersect Earth. And really just a tiny difference in the position of the asteroid as it flies by can do one or the other. So that's, uh, th that's where this uncertainty comes in that, that uh, Phil was talking about. Um, and then, so then Howard McCulsey wants to know, and this is sort of related to that, so Phil, can you explain a little more on a keyhole? Well, that's basically what uh, Emily's saying. A keyhole is just a place in space where if the asteroid passes through that, the orbit gets bent enough that in some future date it will hit the Earth. So, uh, for example, with, um, well, with AG5, with this one I was talking about, in 2023 it's going to pass near the Earth and there it's going to pass very close to this part of space. You can think of it like a bullseye or like a keyhole. That's why it's called that, like a little thing you have to pass right through. And if, if it passes right through that, then its orbit will be changed and then... 10 of its orbits, it has a 1.7 year orbit, 10 of its orbits later, or 17 of our orbits later, the asteroid and the Earth will be at the same place at the same time. If it misses the keyhole, then the Earth's gravity bends it a little bit differently, and then 17 years later, uh, they're in different places, so they don't hit. Now, for every, key, every keyhole like that, there's a zillion others. There's, there's a keyhole where uh, in one orbit, it'll come back and hit us. There's a keyhole in two orbits, it'll come back and hit us. They're all over the place. They're very small, and they're scattered around, and so the odds are uh, most of these get missed. But basically, every time uh, an asteroid hits the Earth, even a meteor or anything like that, they have previously passed through a keyhole, usually, that changes their orbit and makes them hit us at a later date. This is not really something we understood very well until recently. So, uh, as Emily was saying, these nearby asteroid passes are great to study the asteroid. They're also wonderful because they, they test our ability to be able to see how we can predict the future behavior of these asteroids as well. So people are panicking about these asteroids, and I say, don't. I mean, take them as a gift that's wonderful. They're going to miss us, and we're going to increase our knowledge and increase our experience on how to predict these things in the future. It's a good thing. I think that one thing that makes the term uh, keyhole confusing is that people probably have like a mental image of a wormhole. And, it, and it's not like that, that spot in space is any different from any other spot in space. It's just a, a, a place where um, the gravity of Earth has um, a particular um, value and a particular direction that um, al that will alter the orbit. It's kind of like if you play basketball in your driveway, how there's like always that one spot in your driveway where if it bounces there, it goes across the street. And, and it's, it's kind of like that. It's not like that spot on your driveway is any different from any other spot. It's just that the angle and the direction is just right to, so that that bad effect happens. Right. It's that spot on, the, on a billiard ball that you need to hit to make it go into the pocket. Yeah. It's a virtual ricochet. Uh, another thing is that when you talk about a 1 in 625 chance, uh, you're not talking about it as if it's a lottery and every, you know, you're, you're getting 625 tickets and if you get the wrong ticket, that's it. Uh, it's more an indication of the uncertainty that scientists have about the uh, course. And so it's not a matter of uh, luck, it's just a matter of our lack of knowledge about exactly what the, what the orbit is like. And so uh, you may see the probability go up and down just based on how narrowly they can define what the orbital parameters are going to be. Which means that the number one way to reduce our risk from these asteroids is actually the cheapest thing, which is to train more telescopes on them. Because yeah. it's not like they always have a 1 in 625 chance when we track their orbits further and we know where they are uh, in more 
detail, then it's likely that we're going to reduce that number to a lower risk. And, and one of the more interesting things that could happen is, um, at, as Emily pointed out, if you hit one of these things with the spacecraft, you don't quite know what the outcome is going to be. And we also don't, want, we don't know what the outcome will be if it decides to hit a spacecraft. And with these uh, asteroids that are passing well within geosynchronous uh, satellite orbit, um, eventually one of these asteroids is going to commit suicide or murder, I'm not sure what the better term is, with one of these orbiting satellites. And um, who knows, we could lose our cell phone coverage due to a um, misbegotten asteroid encounter. Um, so uh, Philippe, Sol I'm going to say Solor, uh, wants to know, uh, instead of changing the orbit of an asteroid so it misses the Earth, could we change an asteroid so it hits the sun? Just, you know, just throw them all in the garbage. We could, but the energy requirements for that are quite high. So, so if you think about it, if, if you have a ball coming straight at your face, to continue Emily's analogies, um, it only takes a slight tap of the ball to make sure that the ball doesn't hit you. It takes a huge amount of energy to prevent it from hitting you and then send it to the other side of the planet. And that's pretty much what you're looking at here, is, is to get something to miss the Earth, small energy, to get its orbit varied so much that it's taking a straight path towards the sun. We don't want to have to worry about sending things up with that much fuel, mass, energy, whatever it would take to, to totally kill off an asteroid. So we've got a related question. This comes from Dean Callahan. He says, speaking of keyholes, I have a related question. What are these so-called space superhighways that have some kind of super low delta V for interplanetary interplanetary travel. That's sort of like using these keyholes for your own purposes to get around the solar system, right? Uh, Ryan, have you <laughs> done any information on this? I'll let you tackle that one. You haven't? No? Okay, so, so the idea here is um, there are certain paths through the solar system that take less energy than others. This is where you take advantage of the fact that if you have the right elliptical orbit, it naturally carries you to Mars. If you have the right elliptical orbit, it naturally carries you to one of the asteroids. Um, so it's by taking care to use these specific orbits that are very easy to enter from the planet Earth and have orbits that naturally intersect at friendly velocities with these other objects that, that you can really make space often very slow to get places but make it very low energy to get places. Right, right, right. So if we want to like go from Earth straight to Mars as a direct line, we have to have a huge rocket and just shoot nonstop from, yeah. from here to there. But if we want to get there with using a lot less energy than instead we just increase the size of our orbit and, and you've seen these animations if you see like the the spacecraft coming from Earth going to Mars you see they take this big long slow elliptical orbit moving from our orbit to the say to the Martian orbit and then arriving there and there's actually some people have calculated this thing the space highway which is that you can take even more advantage of all these different orbital interactions that you can go from Mars and then just go at the right point and then slowly move, make your way to Jupiter and then I think even make your way back into the solar system and so you can imagine some far future where people are really patient and they would just spend the better part of a hundred years to you know move <laughs> around the solar system so it's not if you're not in any kind of rush there's very low energy ways to move around the solar system yeah. um, all right uh, so, okay, so Roger Sko wants to know, uh, are all the meteors that could potentially hit us or any other planet in orbit in our solar system right now? Is there a finite number of meteors in the system? And uh, why don't, I'm going to give that one to Phil. Um, that's, a, that's an interesting question. I've really thought of it that way before. Um, the answer is, is no, kind of in that the solar system is filled with rocks. There are asteroids out there and comets and all those kinds of things. And there's a finite number of those. There's not really a supply coming in from interstellar space that's, that's coming in and then they're, they're being captured by our solar system. Uh, but what is happening is that sometimes asteroids will collide. We're seeing that this happens maybe even more often than we thought. There have been several images of uh, what look like asteroids in the belt between Mars and Jupiter, where most of them are, surrounded by dust. And what looks like probably what happened is some, some, something like a small asteroid got hit by another one and created a plume of dust around it. And we're starting to see that this, this does happen. Uh, as comets go around the sun, comets, you can think of them as being gravel and rock 
frozen together with water and carbon dioxide and various other things that we normally think of as gases. But when they're out in space, they're frozen. Every time a comet comes near the sun, a little bit of that turns from a solid into a gas, and some of that gravel floats away. So you have one object, which is creating lots and lots more. So uh, the answer to your question is, you know, everything's out there, but more are being created as uh, asteroid collisions uh, create more, create more dust, create more shrapnel, and as comets go around the sun. On the other hand, uh, besides that source of them, there's also a sink where they're going away. Jupiter, Saturn, all the other moons and planets in the solar system are constantly being hit. The Earth is hit by 100 tons of material roughly every day. So we're also vacuuming that stuff out. Uh, as it happens, there's enough stuff to keep hitting us for the next bazillion years. It's not like we're going to see a change in that number. Uh, it's just uh, how frequently the big things hit is, is the concern, and that's why, as Emily said, we need to keep our eyes to the skies and try to map all these guys out. So, so Emily, Thomas uh, Tanaker asks, or Tanaker wants to know, how big a telescope is required to track a 50-meter-sized uh, NEO? Like how, how big of the telescopes are these ones that are, being, are making some of these discoveries? Some of them are actually quite small. So you, you do need a large telescope with a wide field of view. Or those are the ones that are now being used for the surveys that are turning up the most discoveries. But you actually don't have to have a very big telescope to do the tracking. Of course, the larger your aperture, the um, fainter the object you can track, which means either the smaller the object or the farther away the object. So if you've got a smaller telescope, you can only see them when they're either larger or very close to Earth, but you can still track them. And there's a website, the Minor Planet Center maintains a, a page where whenever one of these surveys discovers something new, they immediately post its what they do know about its orbital position and, and velocity to guide amateur astronomers. They're, they want help from anybody who's out there who can do this, who has the ability to point precisely enough in the sky and to, and to time precisely enough the time when they took their photos and to send their observations in because everybody's observations help refine the orbit and again reduce that uncertainty. So you really don't have to have a very big telescope to, to be of some help to these surveys. Um, so I can see we're starting to run out of questions so why don't I uh, wrap this up then. Uh, so, uh, so again uh, if you want to participate in Yuri's night, what's the night again? April 12th, every year, anywhere on the planet or off the planet. Actually, I have a question for Ryan. Sure. I'm curious if, uh, you know, Yuri's Night, it's a great party. It's really fun. I've been to them. It, it's quite enjoyable. And it's wonderful to, have, to be having this worldwide party. I'm wondering if um, you have kind of any kind of social goals or if you do things throughout the year that kind of extend what you do um, to some kind of wider reach. Yeah, um, absolutely. So... During the year, we tend to get involved with a lot of the other activities. There's a lot of space ups that are kind of picking up momentum all over the place. Um, and just trying to be involved with those a little bit in terms of helping them out, of course, and then letting them know about Yuri's Night. Um, I guess on a grand scale of things, we really want to focus on having events, of course, on April 12th and getting people's energy to, to kind of promote that global everyone on the planet is celebrating the same thing all in one day. Um, I mean, the big, big goals, of course, would be to, to make it, uh, I hate to say it, but a Hallmark holiday um, where everyone's celebrating space for the day in some fashion or way. And um, who knows, maybe uh, 50 years from now that, that might be happening in terms of where we go in terms of exploration, but it is a way that people can be inspired and kind of look for what are we going to do next, what are we, how are we going to explore, where are we going to explore. Um, and of course the focus is on space exploration, but all the other um, avenues of exploration are, are just as important. It's kind of our, the fundamental of what makes us human is just going out there and going somewhere new. Um, it was mentioned about the, the 100 year tour of the solar system. I mean, I'm hoping to do a 100 year tour of Earth. Um, maybe get to orbit or suborbit a few times on a few different vehicles during that hundred years. But uh, I think um, exploration in itself is just, it's just something that's easy to share and that hopefully we can connect with some of these other events um, to help be a part of it as well. So we have uh, other activities during the year. 
I had a question also, uh, just because the shuttles are being transferred over to museums this year and, and uh, the Discovery is going to be coming to the National Air and Space Museum just a week after Yuri's Night, and I, I wondered if there was anything special that you and the other Yuri's Night folks uh, had in mind to, to mark that occasion for, for the shuttle program. Yeah, it's going to be a pretty momentous occasion when all the shuttles are in their new homes. Um, we're in contact with a few of the different locations, but not for a specific event or anything, but just to kind of offer our insights on throwing an event and who to reach, how to reach people. Um, I think one of, one of the you know, cool goals would be for next year is to have a Yuri's Night at every single shuttle location. Um, so that's a, a goal that I'm going to push out there and see if people can help with. Um, but I was actually on the Intrepid last weekend and uh, I can just kind of imagine it with the shuttle sitting on the on the deck. It would just the locations are really cool. There's a lot of people that are able to come visit them. Uh, so I'm looking forward to seeing how those are received by the public. Great. Yeah, it it would be so awesome if people knew the date 412 and what it meant as readily as they know the Saturday dates like 911. Yeah, um, it's definitely a day where we can definitely come together. I mean, Yuri. Even though it was a space race and uh, he's a military Soviet Soviet pilot, um, the, his words from space were, you know, I'm looking down below and I don't see borders and I want the world to come together and unite. And, you know, right away that's like, hey, wait a minute, that's not very militaristic. What, what's he talking about? He's like, so he really got people to start to think about how to get along and work together. So that was kind of uh, the early stages of a global movement and... And uh, so it's, it is those kind of early words that are kind of the backbone of how we're able to do Yuri's Night every year. And his birthday is tomorrow. Yes, it is. Um, so I've heard a few rumors of things that might happen during, during the birthday, but um, one thing that's already out there is that Think Geek's already promoting a, a Yuri's birthday discount, so that was kind of funny. And they, they provided some 50th anniversary t-shirts for us last year, and they give us lots of free swag to give out to all our events, so... Uh, it's always fun to work with groups like that. That's fantastic. All right, well, why don't I wrap this up? So thanks again for joining us, Ryan. Really appreciate it. And, uh, and so if people want to start signing up their own Yuri's Night, want to register them, now's the chance. And if it's too late this year, try to do something next year. It's, you know, you'd be amazed. And oh, it's never too late. <laughs> it's never too late. But, uh, yeah. yeah, maybe we'll do a, one on, uh, here on Google+. Plus. We'll do a quick uh, Yuri's Night. I'll just do a, we'll do a hangout that night. Um, so thanks to Alan and Emily and Nancy and Pamela and Phil for joining us this week. And thanks to everybody who watched. If you haven't already, can you please plus one this, uh, this on Google+, Plus so we can see how many people are, are watching it? And, um, and we'll see everyone next week, same place, same time. All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye, everyone.